we're going to start off with a WHO position on this very important topic. And as you might know, the WHO has recently called this year the year of the healthcare worker. I'm sure, Jim, that's going to talk about the importance of this. And why is it? Because it should be always the year of the healthcare worker, who's a very important one. But COVID has shown us how important the healthcare worker is. So what I'm going to do is just kick off with you, Jim, and get you going so that you have your full time. Ask your office to share the slides and then over to you, Jim. Uh, so just for you who know who, who, who Jim is, is um, he's at the WHO and is the Director of Health Workforce and Health uh, and very important position right now. And Jim can take over. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, uh, wherever you are joining from around the world. Uh, my uh, appreciation to the International Hospital Federation and the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, and we've just heard from uh, their representatives in their introductory remarks to join you today. I will give you uh, approximately 15 minutes, uh, an overview from the World Health Organization perspective, and then be available to answer uh, any questions and clarifications that you may have on this very important topic. Uh, next slide, please. Clearly, the pandemic we are all living with at the moment, and the latest figures that uh, are available on the WHO COVID-19 uh, web pages, 111 million uh, infections around the world, uh, 2.5 million uh, reported deaths. Uh, this is something that every country almost is having to, to face and contend with. And at the forefront of the response to the global pandemic are the health and care workers. And in WHO, uh, we have a very wide encompassing definition of these that includes all workers in a hospital or in a care facility in the primary institutions that facility based staff uh, they're not just those who are graduated with a clinical uh, qualification it is the team of health and care workers that are making uh, the difference around the world next slide please as we look at uh, the, the challenges being faced on the well-being of our health and care workforce. Uh, we're looking at this in the context of history and as well as the present and future. Uh, the left-hand column here depicts what was happening prior to the pandemic. In many countries around the world, there was already a shortage of uh, the, the number and the skill mix and the distribution across all geographical areas. We've then had to respond to the pandemic, the emergency response, the surge capacity, which has put people into uh, the all aspects of diagnostics, treatment, uh, coming forward in terms of the, the intensive care, but also the public health response on treat, treatment and testing, and contact tracing. Uh, that has taken people away from some of the frontline essential health services that were necessary to be delivered. Now we have an additional tool, the vaccine, that is being translated into the practice environment, increasing number of countries, and we will be shipping uh, to many of the low and lower middle income countries uh, in February so that they can also start on the vaccine. But that means more of our workforce being put into the COVID-19 response. So as we look at the, this, what are some of the challenges? Next slide. We have put, obviously, the, the, a lot of the evidence that we can sell that comes into guidance and recommendations. Talking. So we're looking, what is the standardized measurement of this? And trying to understand the impact. We're looking, at, obviously, on the personal protective equipment, the infections, unfortunately, the uh, number of deaths that come forward, but also the mental health, the stress, the anxiety. Uh, we heard uh, Jeffrey refer to the evidence of burnout uh, and even the impact of bullying in the workplace. And these are elements that have a negative impact 
on the health, the physical health, and the mental health and well-being of our workforce. Uh, the violence and harassment, the lack of psychological support, and how do we measure that? Next slide, please. This is a continuous effort. We've seen a wealth uh, and you know rapid acceleration of the evidence of COVID-19 across many different geographical settings and across different parts of the care economy and the health economy. Uh, and trying to triangulate and absorb that evidence through use of digital artificial intelligence tools and algorithms, but also through the, the human element. What do we understand that's going on? We have seen the reported level of infections from member states now above 1.5 million from the case reporting forms. But that's only a percentage of all reporting on all infections. We actually estimate uh, more than 4 million infections amongst the health and care workforce. Uh, that unfortunately ha has an impact where the workforce is away from working in quarantine and self-isolation. We've seen through systematic reviews, through living reviews, uh, the impact on depression, anxiety, the prevalence of insomnia coming forward. We've seen how uh, the work conditions and the stress and the environment is translating into uh, protest and labor dispute and labor actions. And when we see in any given year um, the number of uh, strikes and protests would be around 10. And what we've seen in 2020, over 84 jurisdictions have identified protests and strikes, which is a, a worrying rise. And often that's due to lack of it's, it's fear of lack of PPE, it's the insecurity, it's a manifestation of something which is not right in the well-being of the workforce if they are then determined to take some sort of industrial action. And the impact of this is clearly uh, on a negative impact on the overall delivery of essential health services. Over 90% of countries reporting disruptions to it. Next slide, please. Not only are we looking at the work of published review and government data, we're also looking at the constituencies of health professional associations who are working with us to collect and, and consolidate data from their member states, those who are close to the country, close to the brain. And again, we're seeing what it's reported by the International Council of Nurses, many of whose their members are in the hospital setting uh, that mass trauma has been not only their anticipatory anxiety, but actually dealing with such heavy volume of work and heavy mortality in the workplace and being able to cope with that and being able to cope with uh, the concern around bringing infection home to your family members. So this mass trauma that we're coming to, next slide. Similarly, um, where data is available from employers, uh, we're looking at that information and what that surveillance system may be able to uh, provide to us. So many hospitals have robust information on staff absences. And if that gets consolidated and supported uh, into a national geographical jurisdiction, it gives us additional information about the well-being of the workforce. This example from the English um, system, health system, the NHS, and through NHS providers, clearly demonstrating that there is a rising level of staff absence from work, and that 50% of that absence is related to COVID-19. And in this example, we're now seeing a response to that. And literally just in the last couple of days, an expansion of the psychosocial support to the employees, to the workers in these facilities, to the clinical uh, staff and all other occupations and all management and support staff that work in those facilities who are going to be equally challenged with some of the stress and the tension and the trauma of their experiences. Next slide. We also have uh, ongoing work on living reviews. 
the digital world nowadays and this acceleration in the publications, we cannot just do a systematic review and, and sit back and wait for another year. So on a monthly ongoing basis, our living reviews are continuously giving us new data. One example here, but if uh, on the next slide, you know, many other examples uh, which the, the, this information will be shared to you as a presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so that you can actually look at some of this. These are the, the number of reviews that are ongoing and that which we will be able to deliver. Next slide. So with all this knowledge, with all this data, with all this information from constituencies, from employers, from governments, that then comes into the work of filtering for what are we learning? What, is the, what can we comf confidently state as interim guidance that may be valuable across different geographical settings? And these are just some examples. Next slide. Uh, interim guidance now published in December, which looks across the workforce issues. And there are a couple here that are in particular relevant to this topic. Supporting and protecting the workforce, which is absolutely essential. Making sure that there is personal protective uh, equipment. Making sure that we recognize the challenges around occupational health, safe work conditions, and that impact that it has on the the performance and the well-being of the health teams in hospitals is absolutely essential. Next slide. The lessons, again, that we're learning around this, the, the, uh, from all the evidence that we're seeing across the responses, that uh, it is a healthcare team, first and foremost. Yourselves as the International Hospital Federation and people focused on quality and safety. It is the team of personnel involved. We're not distinguishing between a hierarchy of occupations on this. Everyone is in this together and we need to protect and invest in all of them. We need to uh, give them the conditions of work and equip them with the skills and the competencies to perform and, and ensure that they therefore uh, deliver quality of care. Uh, and we need to be continuously updating our evidence base and our information to get forward. One of the ways that we're doing that, next slide, is through the use of digital tools and, and technology. And the WHO Academy responding to the evidence that we've seen from all around the world, this thirst for knowledge. But not only knowledge, how do we convert knowledge into practice? How do we convert knowledge into improved behavior? How do we ensure that the competencies of the workers in these hospitals are actually therefore applying it? So using technology and using digital tools and digital learning to try and cascade that information. We have, um, next slide, we have in November in the resumed World Health Assembly, a decision from member states to designate 2021 as the year of health and care workers. And this is based on uh, a global recognition that they are at the forefront of the response to the pandemic, that they are all these occupations protecting the public, protecting our lives uh, through their work. That level of recognition, yeah, and we must celebrate that has though to turn into action. And the campaign for this year really is to ensure that, um, that we protect those health and care workers that are protecting us, that we invest in them and that work together to do that. And five objectives that we're doing. Firstly, on the vaccination, that all health and care workers have access to a vaccine in the first 100 days of this year that we recognize those who've lost their lives and we celebrate those lives, that we mobilize commitments to action, um, not just commitments to applause, not just commitments um, to more kind words, but actions that will have an impact in the longer term. That we have a dialogue um, with member states, not just ministries of health, but with governments as a whole on a care compact 
those who care for us, we should care for them. We have to make sure that that is ingrained in the constitutional engagement around health and care and social protection, and that we work together in solidarity. And we invite you all, as members, next slide, to participate with us as a constituency, as a constituency of, of hospitals, as a constituency of quality care professionals, as chief executives, as medics, as, as clinicians, whatever role and occupation, as economists, as statisticians, work with us. Uh, get engaged in the international year. Get engaged in these calls to action, um, because through that, togetherness is where we can hopefully mobilize support for the agenda. And final slide, it is um, going beyond the pause uh, that we are looking to do. And we thank you all uh, and welcome you to engage with WHO on this year. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks for the great start to this program and setting the scene for us. Uh, we went for Helen to join, but I will start with the first question we have while Helen unmutes is um, you've, you've laid the groundwork for the recent reasons for uh, healthcare worker safety being so important. Um, well, what are the critical investments that have to happen now? If, if, if I was a member state or if I was a hospital leader, uh, what should I be doing right now uh, uh, to, to invest in, in these, these healthcare workers? What do you think? Well, we're, we're seeing around the world the surge response to the pandemic. Um, governments that for many, many years had, had put a cap on recruitment, suddenly opening up opportunities, uh, bringing back retirees into the workforce, bringing in students into the workforce, uh, making the regulatory frameworks easier to recruit people from uh, who are foreign trained into the country. We've, we've seen over 70 countries around the world making it easier to recruit more people. So make sure your regulation is enabling rather than disabling. Uh, make sure that obviously we maintain standards and quality threat. What are your immediate needs to drive the pandemic response, but also to ensure that we continue to deliver all other health services? The population, they're not going to have to wait forever. We're clearly in a huge backlog coming forward. And think forward, what is the workforce you need for your vaccination program? And therefore, what's the entirety? You drive that investment into it. We know through the evidence WHO has published uh, that we did develop with the World Bank and others, investing in health, education, social protection gives us immediate benefits around health, yes. But it also drives employment. Uh, we are one of the world's largest employers, the economic sector of health and care. Uh, the majority of our workforce around the world are women. So we actually are an economic sector that gives more jobs, and that's an SDG target, to, and especially young women coming through. And these are decent jobs, generally. So make sure you understand what your requirement needs are and then make the financial case and the economic case for those investments. And they are, this is not a cost. The cost was doing nothing. The cost is not investing in preparedness. That cost has been, been born. Let's not have that additional cost coming forward. Let's invest in the people that provide care. Okay. Helen? Yes, another the very interesting question that's come through is in light of um, the risk for healthcare workers during COVID, do you think there is a need to review and update occupational health and safety laws and regulations regarding health related injuries? Can we regard staff um, contracting COVID 19 as a healthcare related in injury? Indeed, now, I published uh, on the um, one of the slides early on, the select examples of COVID-19 um, guidance that WHO has issued included our latest publication on the occupational health and safety for health workers. And that's a, a consolidation of all 
all the evidence and the triangulation of government reporting, employer reporting, um, researchers, etc. Uh, and it sets out very clearly WHO's recommendations there, Helen. And, and we've seen the number of jurisdictions are doing exactly that, recognizing COVID-19 as an occupational uh, risk. Uh, we've seen the, the higher level of risk amongst it. And we set through then a number of opportunities for jurisdictions, national jurisdictions, to look at the, the evidence base for exactly what you're suggesting. And it's clear that we need, as part of the protect theme for the year of healthcare, where we need to protect them with occupational health and safety and the proper risk assessment and uh, compensation if, for whatever reason, they have become infected in the workplace. Yes, I, th I think a lot of people would would very much welcome that. Could I could I ask a question just to follow up? Is that the pandemic seems to be going across the world in stages, and so, so for example, some countries are very good on vaccination already, and others haven't even started. How can we put, spread the learning from some countries ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, to those that are still behind and can catch up and get the same situation a few months later? How can, how can that happen through the, the World Health? Exactly, Peter. And I think, uh, again, the, we're the team in the World Health Organization working with experts all over the world, uh, the strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, similar on diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, we're consolidating the, these lessons learned and these case studies. And not only is it on the WHO website, but the, um, the mobile phone application, which again is in the slide deck, I'd encourage anybody who's participating today, download that. But it has every single piece of guidance on it in all languages uh, of the United Nations, so in all the major languages of the world. Uh, it's there uh, for people as a resource, but it's about how do we turn knowledge into practice? Yes. You know, there's data overload, and health occupations are one of the most trusted occupations around the world today in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but we have to contend with a lot of social media messaging, a lot of news and media messaging, which is not necessarily working with the evidence, but working with other theories and undermining the evidence base. So as, as health occupations and as health leaders, as clinicians, there is a, a, a responsibility to actually know the knowledge yourself, know the evidence, and actually then help put it into practice. So please, I mean, we're, we're making as many of the tools as possible online and on mobile phones. Download the app, have it at your fingertips. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. That has just been um, a fantastic start to our conference today and so much for us to think about and really definitely urge people to engage with the WHO, with the Year of Healthcare Worker, as you've suggested, and also go online and find those excellent materials and, and guidelines which will help you wherever you're working. Um, so thank you so much, Jim, for a fantastic start to our conference. Really lots of food thought there and some really impressive work that is going on.